Hi. Um, the way I understood this is going to work is I will introduce myself and I'll, I'm going to do that by um, going through a bunch of questions you guys sent me, um, uh, inviting me, namely why I did political science um, and political theory in, in, uh, in particular, um, how it helped me or how I see that it helps other people in becoming um, an investigative journalist or um, an academic. Um, and I think I will reference some um, things that are closer to what you guys do, namely sort of what are interesting extracurricular activities that I enjoyed or what I would advise are good extracurricular um, activities for people to undertake. Is that um, on... on uh... That is all, yeah. That's yeah, that. well understood. Good, because I sorry, sorry with this whole telepresence, everything through Zoom. I always, I'm, I'm uh, afraid I miss stuff. I misunderstand. Yeah. Please do whatever you're comfortable with. Well, be careful. Um, the um, I suppose everybody asks questions in the chat to Tease, and then Tease interrupts me if. Someone has a question, right? Well, I have a Q and A in the end, so um, yeah. Yeah, but if, if anything is sort of unclear, or you can't follow me, or you want to 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 have something elaborated in my introduction, please do not hesitate to ask for that. Um, um, but that will be Tease's job to, to yeah, keep, will, keep an eye on that. And of course, if any major news network in America calls the election, let us know. Very important. Yes. And with political scientists, we all we share similar emotions. Um, also, if if you would mind, um, I, I also have always the same request um, when teaching um, through Zoom. Um, would you mind putting on your camera just so I can see if people are still awake? Um, and of course, some people live in uncomfortable um, circumstances or have bad internet connection. Then please keep keep your camera off. Um, I don't want to force you, but I, I do appreciate it. Okay, good. Having said that, I um, did a master's in political theory. And at that, that time, I don't think, uh, but I think it's still for the master's that way. Um, it was political theory and political behavior. The case, Thies, do you know? Um, they grouped together political theory together with sort of uh, voting behavior studies. It could very um, well be still the case. I, I'm, yeah. I'm mostly familiar with the bachelors. Okay, good. No, but um, um, so I will elaborate on both these points. Um, and I came out of philosophy. Um, and the thing was, at I, I, um, it was at the last moment in in Dutch history that you could um, um, study two studies without having to pay uh, an arm and a leg. And um, um, so I chose to, to do a, a master's in political science um, that was closer to what I was already studying, namely political philosophy. Um, and it gave me a, uh, an, a master's, uh, master of science degree together with my master's of arts degree. So I thought that was posh uh, to do. Um, and in the end, I was very happy to choose that. I would. If anything, uh, advise anybody here that if it is within your means um, um, in terms of money and time and um, uh, uh, cognitive capabilities to do two studies, to, to try and do an extra master's, it needs some planning uh, um, um, in order to do that. But the reward is high because when you specialize in two um, scientific disciplines, um, you will start to understand what disciplinary differences are, how different scientific dis disciplines approach different questions. And that's always uh, an experience. You can only experience that. It's not something that you can sort of look up or start on Wikipedia. You have to experience that as a, as a researcher. And it makes you a far better researcher because you suddenly get a feeling for, oh, this is what we're doing. We're doing this and not this, or this is what you guys are looking at and you're doing it through that way. And we, back at where I'm from, we do it the other way. Um, and that's very um, enriching. It makes you um, a better um, uh, scientist, um, if anything. So um, 
but why political theory? Um, what's the fun in that? Well, why was it interested, interesting to me? Um, and of course, uh, my, my uh, the previous speaker um, uh, already elaborated on that, but what I found fascinating and still find fascinating in teaching political philosophy is of course, that you get to play around with concepts that you, if you read an academic paper, I suppose you guys already have some sort of familiarity with academic writing and academic papers. Um, thank you. And um, what every academic paper and every academic um, piece of writing you have to do contains is this sort of definitions and conceptual framework thingy. Um, right behind, right after the introduction, uh, um, where you you enter your hypothesis, and then there's always the moment where you define your concepts and you define um, um, the stuff you're going to use. And the interesting thing is, philosophy in general, um, political philosophy as applied to political science, does never leave that stage we stay there. We never get to write the, the whole paper. We're only there. Um, and I always love the image, uh, the, 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 the first philosopher, Socrates, if you read the, uh, the, the Platonic dialogues, where of course Socrates, Socrates is the protagonist, he's the one inquiring, he's the, the one philosophizing. Um, and there are innumerable, in a number of dialogues, there are weird little scenes. You know, what, what, what's the point of that? Plato was a bit of a symbolic writer, where Socrates suddenly stops in the middle of the market. And he can't go on. And there are moments um, uh, in, I think it's the, um, uh, well, no, it's one of the more, more political, um, not the Republic, but the other one, uh, more uh, political dialogues where everybody, all the, the, the students are having fun and they're all going into a house and they're going to open another bottle of wine and, and, and keep dialoguing. And um, Socrates just stands at the threshold and he can't, he, he freezes again. And he sort of ponders and it takes a long while before he takes in. And that's us. That's the philosophers and the political theorists. We, we, don't, we don't go over the threshold. We stay in, in that part of the paper where we're just tinkering where we, ju we just want to know, okay, how are you going to use that concept? Why? What does that mean? Do you really know what that means? Have you really defined it? And it makes us annoying uh, to other people, um, but there's an enormous amount of beauty um, in, in that discipline, specifically, of course, um, in the political sciences. When I did my master's, um, the whole um, sort of political behavior, political uh, theory um, track of the masters was, and also the, the, the researchers uh, were dealing with um, the, um, the question of populism. Yeah, so the populist movements, uh, new radical right wing movements. Um, and it was a wonderful time to be a political theorist because uh, um, they get themselves into trouble because. Mm -hmm you know, measuring stuff. Um, yeah, but populism isn't a non-normative term, is it though? You know, you, you, nobody calls themselves a populist. You call the other guy a populist. Eh? So it's not, it's unlike communism. Communism is a swear word in some circles, but there are people who seriously call themselves communists. There are no populists that call themselves populists. So you're already dealing with a very normative term. And this caused all sorts of scientific tension and methodological tension. It was a great pleasure to be a political theorist at that moment because you got, you got to completely dismantle um, that concept. And that's the other thing, you get to be normative. Um, um, you get to ask the normative questions. Um, not of course, in, is this good or is this evil? That's not, that's not a normative question. Um, but the question is, if we define democracy as a system that has a number of core norms um, um, and values, then does this movement that calls itself democratic still a democratic movement? Those are normative questions and you can answer those only by studying one thing and those, those are texts. 
and definitions. And that's the one thing to keep in mind. If you're doing political theory, your object of study, and that's why I always thought it was weird that they, they um, um, uh, lopped us together with uh, political behavior. But if you're doing political theory, your only object of study is texts. So you're not looking at the world outside. Um, you're doing the definition work. So it's it's ungrateful work, um, and it's but it's beautiful because you get to read beautiful text. And what's even more, um, what I found inspiring, not so much about philosophy, but about doing this masters in political theory, is that you get to use older texts uh, because we are not interested in if our data is. Uh, up to date. We don't do data, we do texts. Um, and there is an argument in Plato. And the argument, two and a half thousand years old, but the argument is still an argument. And we still have to relate to that argument. And we can still use that argument um, to talk about certain questions in democracy. Or better put, there are problems in Plato. Plato problematizes certain key political concepts, and we still have to deal uh, with those theoretical problems. So, and that's of course a great luxury. Um, but what I found the most interesting thing to do was to go and um, to read the political scientists that you all get in your first year introduction, like the Schumpeter and the Schatzschneider and the, the whole, um, the, the founding fathers of political science, the, the, the early post-war modern political science guys. And it's wonderful to actually read those books those guys wrote um, because they're, they're, they're very still very conscious. They usually come from um, law, political science, political philosophy, mixed departments in the US. And they know what kind of um, uh, concepts they're using. And they're actually quite good in their theory, unlike sort of political um, scientists uh, today. If I can... Uh, if I mean yeah. Um, as you are elaborating on, like political theory is, is re like the name implies, it's very theoretical and normative. Uh, and, and you as an academic can appreciate that. But of course, you're not only an academic, you're also an investigative journalist. Yeah. And what is interesting is, of course, where in, in one world, you're really focusing on the text, as you say, in the other, you are focusing on the world. So I was interested to see. Yeah which skills or, or, or experience do you take from political theory and, and yeah. philosophy and that academic context? Yeah. And how do you apply them then to yeah. your job as an investigative journalist? Yeah, so what is the core methodology? So the core method, the instrument used, where we defined what is, what is the object of study, those are texts. What's the instrument used? What's your methodology used as a political theorist? That's looking at texts where people claim certain positions and say, no, that does not add up. The way you construct your position is flawed for this and this and this reason. So you read sort of you read the text against itself. You go like you want you want to state this and this. But this isn't clear here, you even go into a contradiction. So, and that is why they killed Socrates, but that is also a very good um, journalistic skill. What you learn as a political theorist is to go to trust your own reasoning and to go like, no, 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 that just doesn't add up. You know, it's not me being stupid, that's you having a problem. Um, to have some sort of confidence into that an argument should add up, um, to see where there is some dissonance, to see where there is, where it's, yeah, where there's friction. Now that's something that journalists, um, investigative reporters in particular, when, they know, they're not, when they're not acting on a tip someone gave them, but they have to sort of, yeah, they come to work and there's nothing there yet and they have to start their project. Um, that's where you start. Like, you heard that the other way, they, they, <clears throat> I heard that the other day and it didn't add up. Um, they're saying this isn't it, but it doesn't, it's not true. There's, there's friction in there. Something's not right. So that's on an intuitive level, something you need to have as an investigative reporter. Um, 
So would you say then uh, that those skills that you learn, those analytical skills of dissecting an argument, that is really the core element of uh, political philosophy and political theory that you take with you into your job? Yeah. So you can, you can read a policy paper um, from the government the same way you can read a, a um, paper written by an academic um, or an old track treatise uh, from 500 years ago. And you can find what it's not saying. Right, right. So, so that's the skill that, that I take from political theory. Now to that, there there's an enormous amount of skills as you get a report that don't have anything to do uh, with doing um, is of course something you do with people, not with texts. Um, and there's a lot of sort of um, people manipulation going on in, in a good interview. Um, but also listening, you have to listen. You don't ask a good interview, it's not about the questions, it's about, yeah, you, you listen, you listen, you listen. There again, you hear the dissonance things in someone's answer going like, oh, wait, what are you? Um, that's what a good interview does. Maybe that's a little bit you take from political theory. And on the other hand, uh, you have to go through numbers, you have to add things up, uh, you have to go through um, the, the books of a company. Um, you have to uh, observe, you have to go somewhere and see. And of course, you're gonna tell a story. Now, in a sense, journalistic texts are very argumentative although they are not an argument, but they are making a case. But sometimes, although I investigate, I feel far more like a lawyer than like a detective or a, uh, or a scientist uh, when I do my research, because in the end, you're building a case. To tie into um, that, um, sorry? to tie into that, you, of course, you chose uh, journalism as, as a career opportunity to pursue. Was it something you already did during your studies and not only you, but also your peers? How did that, like, how did the developing process yeah. of, what am I after this? I'm how, how, do you end, how do you end up there? Yeah. So, um, I, one, first one broad answer because you, um, the way you phrased your first question, um, you made me far too much of an active participant in my own life. Um, um, nobody does that. Um, you, you don't, you don't um, choose journalism as a career. Nah, I mean, stuff happens. Um, that's, that's the first thing, you try out some stuff and something works out and the other thing. So also that's my first tip for career is to test out stuff. Anything you do is always just the first step. Um, it's never your career. It's only in hindsight that something turns out to be your career. Um, so uh, take it easy, be playful with it is, is a very, very important advice. Um, and sometimes you get these questions and people like, like, were you always busy with journalism? And you're like, mm, at, the, at the time, no. Looking back at that time, yes. So um, the idea is in hindsight, things get a certain shape. I wrote for the, the, the student magazine of, uh, of philosophy. I wrote for the student magazine at that time, it was called Synthesis um, um, uh, for political science. Um, and I, I wrote an opinion piece for a, um, um, a student website that no longer is really active. But after that, I became the editor in chief there. Um, so suddenly it turned out writing for a bigger audience. And those were all pieces on philosophy, political theory, uh, a theoretical subjects explained for a slightly less academic audience than my teachers. That worked out. Um, and I liked. I, it turned out that I really liked um, making a text. Just, you know, writing a text, someone editing it, going over it again, you know, or the other way around, someone sending me a text and me making it better and, and seeing sort of the engineering of texts. I love that. Um, and I, I still do. And I, do, I love it in academic context and I love it in teaching context and in um, journalism context and even in um, uh, fiction. Kind of context. So the idea, like 
that's also if you if you want to write if you if you're finding that you like writing as a in a not liking to be a writer that's something else but if you like to write if you um, if you find it pleasurable to play around with your paragraphs um, if you are if you feel a slightly perverted pride when you made a good sentence um, then then this is something political theory can be something for you because it's so text heavy and so interesting and then maybe even journalism can be something for you then again, if you already know that you want to be a journalist, or you, at least you're convinced that you want to be a journalist, then maybe even political theory isn't that a good of an option. Maybe go more into sort of policy studies, um, things where you, uh, David Laws still teaches with you guys, right? Uh, no. I don't know, maybe Walter, uh, Walker knows, is he still here? Uh, no. Well. Okay. Doesn't matter, but oh, you have and, and be, during my time. I think um, he's still around. David Laws did all sorts of very interesting things under the umbrella of policy studies, um, but he did some really interesting uh, focus group um, um, interviewing stuff. And I mean, um, that's it's interesting if you if you already know you're going to be a journalist. Um, I wanted to. Um, um, because we don't have a lot of time left, we have Wait. enough to comfortably uh, talk still. But uh, I also wanted to ask you about, you are of course also a teacher of political philosophy. Um, so I wanted to ask you, what, what are the experience or content and skills that you really want to convey to your students and what yeah. makes a good political theory student if there ever was such a thing? Or at least, yeah. what, what, how, when would you enjoy this? Oh, yeah, yeah. What person do you need to be to enjoy it? So, from a teacher's perspective. Yeah. Um, how do I? So, this is the thing. What I don't, the, the student I never was, and the student I find does not come to my elective courses are the students that um, really find some sort of comfort in going into the smallest question of definitions within philosophy of language. And, you know, if you say um, um, John is the king of France, then can you speak of an existence of John? And then not asking that question, not writing a PhD about that, but building a whole career on, on that question. I mean, you have those folks at philosophy and this is considered sort of pure philosophy uh, because you're dealing with the way language is structured per se, you know, uh, sec. Uh, now, logic? In a sense, with logic. And, uh, but also with questions of what meaning, meaning relations are. So more philosophy of language than logic. Um, now, I, I always found that weird. Um, not, not in the sense that I don't see the beauty of that problem because I do and I love. Okay, now this, that's one thing. You need to love problems. You need to have a, a, a certain appreciation of a good problem, you know? You need to be the guy go, or, or the girl, you know, who goes like, oh, that's a very interesting problem. Not meaning like, we're gonna solve that, but like, no, I like to delve deeper into that. There's probably more problems underneath there. So um, I once did a course in language philosophy as a student. And so the teacher went, okay, welcome to, language philosophy. The question of language philosophy is, what is meaning? How do you define meaning? And we were all philosophy students, so we were like, oh yeah, that's an interesting problem. You cannot come to a conclusive definition of meaning, um, even because you need to use the word meaning in the definition of the word, what means meaning. But um, So you have a problem there, and that's beautiful, and we're gonna take a look at that. Um, but it was one girl from language studies, and in the fifth meeting of that course, she just threw up her books 
and and you know looked at the heavens and went, can someone tell me what meaning is? And you're like, no, no, no one can, at least not in a satisfactory manner. Um, you should not think political theory is there to solve um, the problems in the world um, or, or any other problem is there to create problems. However, having said that, referencing back to what I said about sort of pure philosophy, you still need to have a sense of what's at stake. And that's the interesting thing I find about political theory as opposed to political philosophy or as opposed to political science, um, is it is normative. There is something at stake. There is an intimate link between the way in which we conduct science the way we think science should be conducted, you know, with having a view for dissenting positions, being accountable in how we present our things, um, inviting um, critique, and so forth. And the way we have set democracy up as a regime after the war. Those are connected. Um, and it was the interesting thing about studying populism. Of course, if you get movements that denounce science to some extent and also denounce the regime of democracy that was set up after the war um you you get into a huge problem because it becomes not only a normative problem but also a methodological problem and also in a sense a deeply ethical problem um to rest with that but you have to have motivation um, um you have to think that there's something in there, in those texts, um, that will get you out of bed every weekday, at least. Right. A friend of, a friend of mine once said, and then I'm going to turn to the question, uh, in a very wry, is a very wry sense of humor, um, there's something weird about studying philosophy. Because if you study philosophy, you operate on a number of really, really foolish assumptions. Number one, that there is somewhere behind reality a system of a or a principle that regulates or constitutes reality as we perceive it secondly you assume that you as a human being can understand that principle and thirdly you assume that the discipline that has been failing at getting to that principle for two and a half thousand years is the way to do it so I always find that a good joke about uh, philosophy. All right. Uh, thank you so much. My questions, I want to open I up. I suppose the there are more questions for... about investigative reporting and I can answer that too. When I will leave the whole place. Yeah, um, I want to open up the floor if anybody has a question they uh, want to ask. I will ask David. Uh, could you please tell us about some interesting career paths that your fellow political theory alumni have uh, chose? Yeah, those were very divergent. Um, 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 the way I remember it, um, um, someone um, became a uh, at the national level, another one um, um, worked for a think tank, another one became, uh, I believe, a sort of independent um, uh, researcher, mostly aligned with uh, doing uh, research for unions. Now, those are the things that spring to mind um, uh, from the political theory uh, point of view. So all around sort of policy questions, societal problems, and trying to deal with those. But all, in a way, rather, um, uh, research heavy, always leaning towards figuring stuff out for people. Got to keep reading texts. Um, all right, David, I hope that answered your question. Then Victoria has a question again. You can unmute your mic and please ask it. Okay, so um, I recently started to consider um, a career in investigative journalism. I've been watching a lot of um, documentaries on like big investigations like Paradise Papers, Panama Papers, etc. And like I yeah. never got to talk to an investigative journalist before and I just want to kind of like tell you like my 
like why I'm thinking about doing it just to see yeah. if I'm completely lost and I feel like or like <laughs> yeah. if it makes sense. But like pretty yeah. much like yeah. studying political science made me like it was really frustrating in a way that now I feel like I don't trust anyone anymore. I don't trust institutions. I don't trust democracy. I'm really like frustrated with how things are working and it made me realize that I don't against it I want to like really try to like break the system somehow and the only way that I'm finding to kind of like pursue that is either through art or through investigative journalism and maybe like one day finding a way of joining them together but I don't know if I'm fooling myself thinking that I'm actually gonna graduate and reach the point that I'm going to be able to join investigations such as the Paradise Papers mm -hmm. yeah. and like if I should do a master's on journalism if I I don't know I'm kind of I just just want to like some opinion okay well to unravel your questions um yeah you to be completely honest you of course you don't get to do the Panama Papers um uh to be a, a, they ask you, um, that's what, what they do. So you have to be already a, a um, uh, appreciated investigative reporter. Um, but that's, I think that's the, the easiest question to answer. Um, there, I, there is a misconception that I believe also informs your question, um, that investigative reporters are somehow working against the system. Um, and that's, uh, that's not true in the sense that, um, of course, we point towards injustices and we point towards um, uh, moments where the system fails the people it should protect. Um, I mean, yes, of course, that's what we're doing. So we are very much looking at where things go wrong. Um, we are constantly dealing in injustices. That's when we go, ah, nice. Um, um, and that's, I mean, that's a perverted side of what we're doing. Like, ooh, ooh, yeah, nice. That's a good injustice. Uh, we can work with that. And, but on the other hand, um, I only do that because I do think that I live under a, under a system that can be held accountable and it has certain pretenses. And then I say, you fail your own pretenses that the system will go, oh, sorry, we're gonna amend that. Um, my experience that um, the most good we do is completely um, provided by institutional responses to our work. Um, I think the, 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 the work I'm very proud of is work where I really show how the system fails people, um, how the system, uh, for instance, how, how we as a society have completely ignored the trade that people have with a computer salesman or um, a, a gym or anything. And how people are trading that, those debts and then trying to get the money from you. And it's a whole, whole perverted system that, that, that arose in, in the Netherlands, not only in the Netherlands, of course. Um, but the responses to that were twofold. First of all, the, the public went, oh, this is a shame. Uh, good that you're addressing it. Uh, what, a, what a terrible story. Wonderful. Good. And of course, the people we... Uh, we interviewed and we portraited, they felt heard and they felt recognition and that's all good. But the law courts, parliamentarians, um, aldermen, mayors, those folks by the system. Um, and I have a deep, 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 deep suspicion of journalists that have sort of this anti-institutional um, frame. It makes you look really cool. It makes you look really sincere. Um, 
but you're not going to help anyone. I am, I am a very firm believer um, and not in a, I have faith, but I see evidence that the most good that is being done is through collect, collective action orchestrated for by um, institutions. So I'm not a, I am, however, sometimes accused of being a cynic, um, um, where people say, uh, uh, you don't trust anybody, uh, you think there's uh, there's nefariousness, there's evil, uh, and there's, uh, what do you call it, eigenbelang, uh, sorry, when they go into investigative journalism, my English fails me. Um, there is um, this, you're called this, you should know what eigenbelang means. You're Dutch. That's very Dutch. Personal bias or personal? No, uh, your interest, personal interest. Everything is for personal gain. Okay. And that's true uh, within boundaries you know um, and the interesting thing is that even if you reference the panama papers so even with tax avoidance and with make and and sort of dark money uh, um, trails um, the government has at least a story for itself why this is maybe for the common good or why this is collateral for policy that is directed at the common good. Um, and it is exactly because the government has that pretense, because they're not. Questions as well. Um, yeah. We're uh, stressed for time. Maybe you can. Sorry. <laughs> That's OK. Um, yeah, sorry, Victoria. Uh, um, uh, or, or wait, sorry, was it Victoria? Yeah, Victoria. Uh, uh, cut your question, your answer. So, uh, a, a pesky little nastiness in the system. You want to push people, you want to advocate change, you want to, nah, nah. then the NGO world is something for you. Go into that. Stay outside of the system, push, be angry, organize, do it, go into grassroots organizations. But journalism is very institutional and not exempt from all the sins that you listed earlier. Right. Right. Um, all right. Thank you. Um, so then we have uh, two more questions and maybe some more will come up later. We don't have a lot of time since we're nearing seven. Yeah. So uh, what is something you wish you had learned during your political theory studies? So what was maybe missing that you wish you were, was there? Well, what I miss um, during political theory um, was sort of the theory of political science. That's really something I thought was a, was a bit of a spot. Uh, was I thought we would be the watchdogs of, um, well, that's, we would be the watchdog of our discipline. You know, we would be sort of the surgeons uh, claims this or political science now claims this, but they have a problem with their concepts. Um, and I think it was very, um, I find it too sterile in that sense, if that makes any sense. I wanted to do more uh, critiques of methodology, actually connect philosophy of science to political theory. That, that would be something I thought had, was a huge sort of critical uh, potential within the discipline that wasn't really explored. Um, Maybe a lot of too theoretical in a way. Theoretical too enough. Theoretical in a way. Um, um, that you could criticize the, the political scientists um, by go, by doing some proper political theory. That was my that was what I would like. Okay. But, um, then there's another question on internships. Uh, what do you know if what sort of internships are opportunity internship yeah. opportunity there are any theory or you know theoretical physics um, or philosophy is there's only one straightforward career path and that's becoming a scientist becoming uh, an academic but we but hear what I say it's the only obvious career path and there are a host of other very not so obvious career paths. I mean, none of the people I studied with actually became an academic within political theory. I became one in political philosophy. It's slightly different. So 
Um, what I mean to say by that is people would want you, but you have to explain them why they would want you. We're very text-based, very good in, in working with text, would always make you an interesting intern for a media company uh, uh, or something, but remember that you have to explain to them what you do and why. Um, we also, we don't take internships, we take some sort of traineeships here um, at, at my uh, work where I'm an investigative reporter, I teach in that module, and we get too many letters where people have just the most exotic um, uh, backgrounds going like, um, my background in accounting and queer film theory makes me an excellent investigative reporter. It does not. And if you think so, why? Explain, please. So that's something, if you do political theory and you want to pursue internships or other different careers, remember that you have to explain. But then again, you're gonna be really good at explaining um, and you're gonna be really good at writing texts. And so you'll write a convincing letter. Um, but of course, there's nothing obvious uh, about it. It's a bit of an endangered right. species. But there are uh, then more op more opportunities than just academic, but you have to be a bit more. Yeah, very much in, in investigating, in, um, in everything. I mean, in the end, um, most employers are looking for someone who's and um, um, can work well within a team. Then we have uh, one last question and um, we might go a bit over time for that, but if you're okay with it, we can just do this one uh, and then we'll finish up. Um, and that's from uh, Julia. It's, I'm wondering if one, if one wanted to inquire about what happens behind closed doors among the elite, would you say an investigative journalist has an easy to disclose? It might be a bit difficult to answer, but uh, try try and keep it brief. Uh, but still, huh. if that is possible, um, yeah. So there are too many assumptions in this question, but I'm gonna. I mean, um, that's something, that, and that's what I meant with political theory should be the watchdog. Um, elites is a term from political science, amongst other things. But it's an analytical term. It's something we use as political scientists to describe a group of people with, it, with a certain position within a society. Sorry, I'm being boring about this. But the thing to understand is there is no elites out there. You can't go to, uh, could you please give me the number of the elites or something? There's no elites, how can I help you? That does not exist. There, there, like, um, um, it's something you say about someone else. And I, know, I'm not, I don't want to ridicule your question, uh, just to be sure, um, uh, not at all. But remember that if you go to someone and you say you're elite, many people will say, no, I'm not. I, I feel I'm, 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 constant, I'm not comfortable. Uh, um, I feel under pressure, I have competitors, uh, I have people critiquing me, I have the, the IRS. Uh, uh, so, um, um, but I know what you want to point at, of course, what you're asking for is, so there are certain groups within society that have a disproportionate amount of influence. And these groups, they sometimes get together, um, they decide stuff, which is true. I mean, what I'm now describing, for instance, is the fact that the, the Ministry of Energy in Holland does not have a lot of, does not even exist. There's a Ministry of Economic Affairs. The people there at the Department of Energy questions, they're a bunch of uh, political science made uh, graduates and they have to decide really complicated energy questions. They don't have an enormous amount of expertise. You know who does? Shell. So they call Shell to inform them about questions. And that's what goes on behind closed doors. If you would ask, anyone they'll tell you yeah yeah I mean if we're going to write a law we want the players that it's going to affect to be advising us about the law and this is how weird decisions come about and even years before parliament gets to see a law it already has been discussed with key players with stakeholders it's a beautiful depoliticized name um, so that's something that goes on more or less behind closed doors. That's to say it doesn't happen on television. It doesn't happen in parliament. Um, so how do you 
how do you find out? You talk to people. Um, but usually it's not behind closed doors as much as you'd think. There are, it's all publicized who they ask for advice. It's all on, it's all in the public records who they um, ask for um, an opinion or a view on a certain policy. So I think what, what investigative reporting does at this moment in time um, is that many things are one way or another, consciously or unconsciously recorded. Most things leave a trail and that's the trail we follow. And we have tricks for that. Um, and that's what you learn during investigative reporting. But many things where you would say afterwards that was decided behind closed doors. At the moment that people are figuring stuff out, trying to come to a policy, trying to come to a law, they don't experience it themselves as behind closed doors. There's, there is not a table with lights, you know, um, with, with lights going under it where people come together with hoods and discuss things. It doesn't happen that way. Um, it's very open. It's very, it all, it's all very um, boring in a sense and decisions get reached very, very slowly and then suddenly quickly because something's under pressure, someone has to do something. Um, but it's not that as straightforward as that. All right, I wanna wrap things up. Thank you so much uh, for sharing. Would it be possible maybe if there are any further questions to forward them to you? Uh, yeah, no problem. Uh, you guys have my email address. Um, you can ask me anything. The only thing is that um, I don't, um, expect, you know, an answer in 24 hours. Um, um, but I would love to answer your questions. That's no yeah, problem. We'll be understanding for that. We'll understand that. Um, if you are Dutch, please find uh, Thomas's uh, articles on investico.nl. Uh, if you're not... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or just Google and you yeah. will... Yeah, or Google me. But if you want to find you most the most interesting articles are always published in the Groene Amsterdammer. Um, and if you want to find them with footnotes and um, more uh, interesting things, you can go to uh, the organization I work for. All right. Thank you so much for sharing and uh, willing to speak. Yeah, I hope it was still interesting to everybody and um, and didn't talk too much. Um, I think we all enjoyed it. Good. We well, have a wonderful night. Um, and who knows, maybe the whole thing gets cold before we go to sleep. Okay. Yeah. All right. I want to thank everybody for attending as well. Uh, for Mo20, this was already the last project major event. Um, so I hope you all, uh, we gave you a bit more clearance about, about what, uh, 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 what political theory or any other major. And uh, we hope to be hearing from all of you. Thank you for coming. And have a great night. Thank you. Bye-bye.